Welcome back to Silhouette Success. If you are new around here, welcome. Today we are going to be talking about the page setup panel. And I know that a lot of you are thinking that this is like beneath your pay grade. This is basic stuff. You already know it, blah, blah, blah. However, I am pretty sure that there are a couple things in there that you are missing that could be helpful to you in your designing experience and it's always a good idea to just take a break and refresh what you already know so you're going to want to stick around to the end and learn everything there is to know about the page setup panel you should be starting each and every project with the page setup panel it can save you a ton of time and aggravation throughout your designing process. So if everybody is ready to refresh their brains a little bit, maybe learn a little something new, let's do this. In Silhouette Studio, the page setup panel is located at the top right hand corner of your screen and looks like a piece of paper with the bottom corner folded up. You can also get to this panel through the panels tab on top here. At the top of the page setup panel, you'll see three tabs. You have page setup, grid settings, and registration marks. We'll look at each one of these in order. In the page setup tab, the first thing you're directed to is choose your machine. This is important if you own more than one silhouette. I have the Cameo 4 and the Curio, but my Curio is a bit dusty these days. This could be a reminder to pull it out and use it more often. Next, you want to choose your mat option. 12 by 12 is the default, but you can choose no mat or 12 by 24. There are also options for the portrait and the pic scan mat. If you have a mat selected, a virtual mat will show on the design screen. If you have no mat selected, you will only see a representation of your media. Next, you can choose your media size. A lot of the time, I will leave this as 12 by 12 or letter size, but this comes in super handy if you're using a scrap that is an odd size. You can also use it as a template if you set it to the size of your blank. For example, if I'm working on a pencil bag that is 8 by 6, I can set that as my media size and I'll be able to see the size of the design in relation to the size of the pencil bag before I cut anything out. You can enter the measurements here, enter the width and the height, and here you have transparency. If you pull the slider to the right, your media becomes more transparent and allows you to see the virtual mat underneath. This can be helpful if you're working without grid lines and we'll get to that part in just a few minutes. Next, we have a little checkbox here next to constrain media to cutting mat. If this box is unchecked and you have your media selection set to custom, you can set your media size larger than the cutting mat. If this box is checked, then your media must fit on the mat itself and measure no larger than 12 by 12 or 12 by 24 if you're using the larger mat. Moving on to orientation. This option is helpful if you're using letter size media or any rectangular size. Let's set our media size to letter for a minute. And we start off in portrait orientation and we can switch to landscape. This next option is relatively new and actually pretty helpful. We're looking at media color now. Before this feature was added, users would have to draw a rectangle and fill it with a color of their media, then send it to the back of their design to get a visual of what the end product would look like. It wasn't a huge hassle really, but sometimes it interfered with selecting the actual design elements. I would often try to grab an element, but would click on the background instead, have to undo and try again. With media color, you can simply change the color of the virtual media and it will not interfere with the actual design. This will not print. It is only meant to be a visual aid. The next feature is also a visual aid and does not affect how the machine will cut. With rotate view, you can spin the virtual mat. 
Notice the black arrow moves too. That is always the top of the cutting mat and that is what you will need to load into the machine. The last two options on this tab let you toggle the print border and the cut border on and off. The print border is gray, the cut border is red. Now moving on to the second tab, we're going to look at the grid settings. This panel makes lining designs up easier and allows you to turn the smart snapping feature on and off. If you'd like to see me using the smart snapping feature while creating an actual design, watch this video, but after you finish this one. The first section is options. You can toggle the actual grid on and off and you can opt to show the guides or not. When you turn the grid off and set your media color, you get a more accurate visual of your project. Let's jump back to the first tab for just a minute. Here the grid is off. I'll set the media color and I can start designing on a clear canvas. If I need to check the grid, I can use the transparency slider. Back to the second tab now, let's create a guide. You double click on either ruler and pull the blue line to wherever you need it. If you pull from the top ruler, it creates a horizontal guide. If you pull from the right hand side ruler, it creates a vertical guide. If you hover over the guides, your cursor turns into a little up down arrow and you can right click and pull up some options or double click and reposition it. To the right of these, you have snapping options. You can snap to grid or to guides or to both. Let's start with snap to grid. Check the box to turn this feature on. Grab a rectangle and you can see that the element begins right at the grid line and fills in in complete squares as I drag out. I'm going to jump ahead for just a minute here and increase the divisions on my grid. The design then snaps to the smaller increments and allows you more precision. Let's turn off Snap to Grid and turn on Snap to Guides. Now when I move my design element close to the guide, it's pulled to the guide and lined up perfectly. Here you can turn your rulers on and off and next to that you have your crosshairs. Crosshairs are another way of lining up design elements. Some designers love this feature and leave it on all the time and others are not fond of it at all. Let me get rid of these guides real quick and we can take a look. I right click on the guide and brought up my options. You can see here that I can delete or delete all. I'm going to select delete all and the guides are gone. Let's turn the crosshairs on now. This feature creates two vertical and two horizontal lines that mark the center of your cursor. They stretch over the entire screen and follow your cursor. I'm going to draw out a circle now so that we can get a feel for them. To be honest, I'm on team no crosshairs, so I'm having a time demonstrating their functionality. If you love them and use them often, please drop a comment with their benefits and help me out on this one. I am happy to turn those off and move on to the Smart Snapping section. Smart Snapping is another alignment tool that helps you align different elements on your design page. This feature does not snap to the grid or guidelines, it snaps to other elements. The first thing you'll notice when watching this is the blue lines that appear when two elements line up. They appear whenever the top, bottom, or middle are aligned. What you probably won't be able to see is that the elements are pulled into alignment. This is great if you need precision, not so great if you're working on a project where you want things placed randomly. But I do use this feature quite often and it's super simple to toggle on and off. Let's move one of these designs off the mat for a minute. 
you can see that the smart snapping still works. Unless, of course, I check this box, then the software only detects the elements that are within the media settings. The tolerance slider determines how close to alignment the objects need to be before they're pulled into position. This one is definitely something you should play around with when you have an extra minute or two. Moving on now, let's look at spacing. Your first option is square or isometric. Square is just typical grid lines that every normal human being uses, and isometric is a diagonal grid that would only be used by psychopaths. Just kidding, but this really does boggle my brain a bit. The spacing slider allows you to adjust the size of the squares on your grid. Most people prefer to leave this at one inch to match the cutting mat. If you're looking for more precision in your design layout, you can use the division slider and create secondary lines in between the primary grid marks. After that, we have color, which allows us to change the primary and secondary lines separately. Notice that the secondary lines are somewhat transparent so that it's easy to spot the primary marks. There are a ton of ways to customize your designing experience here. So break out of your comfort zone, do a bit of work in this tab, and see if you can save yourself some time and headache by utilizing some of these features. Let's move on now to the tab for registration marks. This one is all about print and cut. Before we start, I'm going to go back and set the grid to normal and change my media size to letter. I also like to have both my print and cut borders toggled on for this. The first option you'll see is to simply turn the registration marks on or off. You only need these turned on for print and cut projects. And if you have the registration marks on for regular cut, you will have issues in the send panel. Before we go any further, I want to say that just because you can do something, that doesn't always mean you should. You can change the settings for your registration marks, but chances are high that the level of accuracy is going to drop. I personally leave the registration marks at their default settings. And now that we have that little disclaimer out of the way, let's move on. You can increase or decrease the length of the registration marks with this slider. You can see that this also increases or decreases the area that you have to work with. You always want to keep the gray hashed area clear when using the print and cut feature. Next, you can adjust the thickness of the registration marks. You might want to give this a try if your machine is having issues with reading the marks. I personally have never needed to do this, but increasing or decreasing the thickness of the marks does not affect the size of the design area. Let's go on to inset now. This slider adjusts the registration marks equally, and you can scale the design area up or down leaving it centered on the print page. If we click on Advanced Options, we can adjust the size of our design area with more control over where the design will be. This can be useful if you only need a small design cut. By moving the bottom inset up and the right inset in, you can place your design in the top right corner and leave the rest of the sheet for using another time. The next button may be the most important, in my opinion. It is Restore Defaults. If you get in here and start experimenting only to find that your results are not great, you're going to want to click this button here. It will reset all of the settings for you. And I never want to discourage anybody from exploring to see exactly what can be accomplished with the software and the machines. Just be aware of the cost. Try using copy paper for your trials instead of you know, sticker paper, which is way more expensive. Orientation here is a visual aid only. As you can see, the inverted button flips the whole mat. The black arrow that shows you how you'll need to load your machine is now down at the bottom. 
This means the black square will always need to be in the top left hand corner when it's loaded into your silhouette. Print bleed will tell the printer to bring the color out a bit from the edge of your design and you can adjust how much with the slider. Turn this on if you're getting a white line around the design that you don't want. We're almost to the finish line now. The last thing we need to cover is the barcode feature. I just recently started using this and if you want a more in-depth explanation, I'll link that video up at the end. I highly recommend that you use this feature though. It is kind of amazing. So first you can use this box to turn the barcode on and off. After that, it gives you the option to add the barcode file to your library. I don't have mine connected right now, but if I had, it would show up in the drop down list here. Now I think that I have covered everything. If I've missed something or if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below, or you can always hop on over to the book of faces, search up a silhouette success. I have a page and a group. I'm always on there and easily accessible. I love answering all of the questions you might have. I also have a ton of other videos on YouTube explaining the software. This one is particularly good. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch that or go create something amazing. And I will see you in the next video.